this morning. Please turn in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 6. We will be looking at verses 1 through 14 this morning, and as we continue our, our what's that? Oh, yes. I've done this for seven and a half years, still can't remember it. Dismiss the children to Children's Church. Thank you, Dr. Baum. Yeah. Yes, children are, are, are welcome to leave to Children's Church. The rest of you, you got to stay. I mean, you're fortunate, so you get to stay. But we're going to continue our look this morning in Nehemiah chapter 6, the first 14 verses of this chapter, and, and what I'm simply calling the application of wisdom to the enemy's snares, we'll see here in a moment as we uh, work through the passage, um, that we live in a world where the enemy does not rest. And we'll see in Nehemiah's example, of course, as he's living his life, as he's standing for truth, we see this pattern developing. And you may think this morning we've kind of covered it, and I would say, yeah, we've seen uh, the enemy attack. We've seen many different ways in which the enemy attacks. And again, we see uh, the response. You know, you and I live in a world where the enemy does not want you to be a light that shines for Christ, to speak of Christ, to share Christ, to point people to Christ. Uh, we live in a world where the enemy wants to even produce doubts in your own mind about Christ. And so we want to live our lives with wisdom. We want to see the application of wisdom, of God's wisdom to our lives as we live. We want to be a light uh, and a, a testimony. We want to realize we have a real enemy. The Bible never tries to prove our enemy to us. It just tells us, here's your enemy. And we understand that. But we want to be wise, and we want to learn from this passage how Nehemiah navigates these snares. What is he doing? How does the enemy attack? How do we grow in this? There was a story of, of a stagecoach company that was looking to hire some drivers. And because of the, the terrain in which they, uh, the stagecoach was on and, and the, the direction it was going, they needed some drivers with experience. And so they put the announcement out there, the advertisement for the job, and the day came where uh, the office was full of, of men who wanted to uh, apply for this position, and they began to interview them one at a time. The boss would go through kind of the normal procedure, ask basic questions, and then he would ask this very specific question. He said, how close can you drive the team to the edge of the cliff as you round the mountain. First applicant said, well, I'm pretty confident in my driving skills. I can drive that team within three feet of the edge of the cliff. The boss did some other formalities and thanked them for coming and said, we'll let you know. Invited the next gentleman in who was out there waiting for an interview. He came in and he went through the same formalities you would think of, a, of an interview and he came to that same question. How close <clears throat> can you drive a team to the edge of a cliff as you round the mountain? Well, this, this person had a little bit more experience, a little bit more confidence. He said, I could drive a, a coach, a team, within one foot the edge of the cliff. Well, that's very good. He responded, gave him some formalities, and he asked the gentleman well, to, to, to leave. We'll let you know. He asked the next applicant to come in. Went through the formalities, asked the same question. This person responded and says, I have no idea how close I can drive a stage to the cliff. I do know I will keep the stagecoach as far from the cliff as I possibly can. Yes, he was hired. <laughs> and it's, it's true today as we think about how we live our lives in the world. Some of us have these ideas of how close can I live to the world and not go off that cliff? How close can I come? How much can I enjoy of the world? How much can I imbibe, if you will, of the world and not go off that cliff or not feel that I have done damage to my conscience or so on, whatever we might say? And there's a wonderful truth we see here in Nehemiah. He is not going to steer his life anywhere close to the snares that are presented to him. And I think there's some wonderful conviction 
uh, that we can glean from this for our own, right? Follow our own life following after the Lord. And so this is the passage. Uh, Beginning in chapter 6, we'll read through 1 through 14. It says, Now when it was reported to Sanballat and Tobiah and to Jessam the Arab, to the rest of the enemies that had rebuilt the wall, and that no breach remained in it, although at the time I had not set up the doors and the gates. Then Sanballat and Jessam sent a message to me, saying, Come, uh, let us meet together at Kephram in the plain of Ono. But they were planning to harm me. So I sent messengers to them saying, I I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? They sent messengers to me four times in this matter. And I answered them in the same way. Then Sanballat sent his servant to me in the same matter a fifth time with an open letter in his hand. In it it was written, it is reported among the nations and uh, Geshmu says that you and the Jews are planning to rebel. Therefore you are rebuilding the wall and you are to be their king according to these reports. You have appointed also, uh, excuse me, have also appointed prophets to proclaim in Jerusalem concerning you, a king is in Judah. And now it will be reported to the king according to these reports. So come now, let us take counsel together. And then I sent a message to him saying, such things as you are saying have not been done, but you are inventing them in your own mind. For all of them were trying to frighten us, thinking they will become discouraged with the work and it will not be done. But now, O God, strengthen my hands. And when I entered the house of Shimea, the son of Deliah, the son of Mahetabal, Uh, who was confined at home, he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us close the doors of the temple for they are coming to kill you and they are coming to kill you at night. But I said, shall a man like me flee? I think every man should underline that one. And could one such as I go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Then I perceived that surely God had not sent him. But he uttered his prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He was hired for this reason that I might become frightened and act according and excuse me, and act accordingly and sin that they might have an evil report in order that they could reproach me. Remember, O my God, Tobiah and Sanballat, according to these works of theirs, and also Noadiah, the prophetess, and the rest of the prophets were trying to frighten me. Let me offer a brief prayer as we look at this passage. Lord, we thank you once again that we can come and assemble together and, Lord, look to your word. We ask simply now that by your spirit you would instruct us, Lord, and grow us. Teach us, Lord, we ask, that we too, like Nehemiah, would see the application of your word in our lives, that we would have eyes open to see the snares of the evil one, and that we too would apply your word to these situations. So, Lord, guide us now. Get me out of the way. Let us receive, Lord, what you have for us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, it's safe to say, right, that no work for God goes on without opposition. I think that's one takeaway we can glean. We can glean that over and over and over again through Scripture. And last Sunday, as we looked at this godly character of Nehemiah, we we see who he is. We get this picture of who he is. And this morning, uh, we'll see how he applies that character to action. Last Sunday, we said he was noble, 
That was the attitude of his action. He had a fear of God. He mentions in verse 15, which is the foundation of his behavior. He has a right reverence of God and a fear of God. He does not fear men, which is clearly evident in the passage we read. And these men are trying to kill him. He doesn't seem he's too worried. His devotion is a wonderful example. Remember, he's working on the wall. He's got work boots on and gloves or work sandals, whatever they had at the time. His sacrifice, he gave of his own. He provided. He never took uh, the governor's allowance, if you remember. He He gave of his own to support the work. Not only did he not tax the people, he provided for the people. And then we saw last week that prayer ultimately is the lifeline. This is who he is. This is who Nehemiah is. And you would think at this point, the enemy goes, this guy is pretty savvy. He's pretty connected to the Lord. We've got nothing on him. We'll just call it a day. That is not the case. I love this quote from Yogi Berra. He said, it's not over till it's over. And this is where we're at. They're not giving in. They're not giving up. The enemy is not going to just quietly go into the night. We learn something about the character of our enemy. So we've seen the resistance. We've seen the tactics. We've seen Nehemiah respond. Let's put some guys on the wall. Let's get some trumpeters over here. Let's do this. Let's do that. And again, they're not uh, going away quietly. The work on the wall is almost complete. And their answer to this, their determination is, let's, let's kill this guy. That's where they resolve to do this. Uh, we haven't been able to, to you see a, a powerful parallel to our Savior They haven't been able to stop them. The wall is going up. What's left is the gates. How do we stop this? Well, I've got got some ideas. Let's just take him out. So Nehemiah is invited by his enemies to meet with them. Hey, come out. And you see how it gets a little bit more aggressive and a little bit more aggressive. And then they try to use this element of, of religious deception upon him. And he's just figures it out. He calls it for what it is. And his response is always, why should the work cease? Why should I stop? Why should I come down to you? We have to realize, you and I, we have a mission today. The Lord's called us to go into all the world. That includes our own community and to make disciples, teach all he's commanded, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we come to this, and, and even though we know as, as Nehemiah has real adversaries and uh, we're going to have adversaries, how does, this, how does this leader who's got this wonderful godly character has told us the fear of God compels him? It's the foundation of his behavior. Excuse me, how does that, uh, or what does that, should I say, look like when it comes to the enemy's snares? Well, that's a good question. I'm glad you're asking it. And this leads to my first point, the first four verses. What is the first tactic that these guys try to do? Well, they want to divert him. Just come down off the wall. We want you to stop working. They send four times these messages to him, getting him to say, come, let us meet. Let's just meet together. Let's, Let's come together and figure this thing out. Let's get you stop working on the wall. Come meet with us. So we got to realize that there is going to be diverting temptations in your own walk. Today we might see those manifest themselves in any type of social media. Uh, count the hours you spend on your phone over against God's word. Should give you an idea. So we see diverting temptations are met with. How does he respond to that? He has a very focused determination. And I use the word focus, discernment. It, it, it all comes together. He has a calling on his life. He knows where he's going. He knows the situation. He knows the context of these people. He, he didn't fall off. I used this turnip truck, right, last week. Uh, sorry if you drive turnips, but he didn't fall off the turnip truck last week, that saying, right? He's savvy. He knows what this is about. He has insight. He's, he's walking humbly with his God. And the wisdom he is gaining from walking humbly, humbly with his God is being applied to this. So their first scheme is to get him to compromise. If we can get him to look upon this situation, to come down off that wall and have a conversation, and ultimately we know their plans is somewhat to, to extinguish his life, 
Uh, and we see as it grows a little bit more, a little bit more, if we can trick him. But Nehemiah is not yielding to this. Uh, his enemies know. What do they know? The, the, the wall's almost finished. Uh, the gates aren't hung yet. Uh, for them, it's go time, right? We got to do so. If we're going to do it, now's the time to do it. So they come to him. They present a friendly meeting. Uh, we're all on the same team here, Nehemiah. Remember that time, right, as kids? I don't know. They make some stories up. But he goes quickly to, he ex- tells us point blank what this is all about. I mean, it sounds kind of nice. Hey, hey, come down, let's reason. We see that contrast. But, he says, they were planning to harm me. See, Nehemiah is equipped. Right? He, he sees this for what it is. He sees through the outward appearance. I think that's very important for us. If you're in Christian leadership, elders, pastors, deacons, deaconesses, you serve a Sunday school teacher, whatever it might be, if you're in leadership in any capacity, we must realize that all, not all, and this goes true for every Christian, I'll say it like that, not all professing Christians are Christians. Sambalat is, is a son-in-law. He's married into the family. Tobiah is a Jew. They should be on the same page. They're not. There must be discernment. So discernment simply here is the ability to judge matters according right, to God's view, God's standard. What does God's word say about this? We're not to look upon simply the outward appearance. How often do we get uh, caught by that? Outward appearances. The Lord told Samuel, looking for a king, this is what he says, do not look at the appearance or at the height of his stature because I have rejected him for God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart for Samuel 16, 7. Right? So we are not to look at the outward appearance. We're not to be duped. We're not to be those who just randomly fell off the, the turnip truck. Right? I don't know if does anyone know that saying, how fast was the turnip truck going when you fell off at that moment of epiphany? Okay, everyone's with me on that. But see, discernment sees this, right? It's, it's not to confuse discernment with saying, well, that's, uh, that's just being negative or cynical. Some people think that's their spiritual gift. It is not a spiritual gift, being negative or criticizing. See, discernment sees good where others miss it. But it also sees bad where others are saying it is good and it's not. And this is what we see in Nehemiah. See, we suffer. Christians will suffer today for lack of discernment. They'll follow leaders and teachers who look good. They sound good. They've they've got the right words. They've got the right look, whatever that is. According to them, they've got it. But we can see, quite it doesn't take long, we can, we can see that these aren't people who are walking with Jesus. Remember Paul Washer one time stating, I just need to hear a pastor pray and I can tell you if that man walks with Jesus. And here we have a picture of Nehemiah. It's as if he's gone to the Word of God, right? He's equipped by the Word of God. He hears the situation. He's looking upon it and he's discerning. It's as if he has these words, Proverbs 27, 6, running through his mind. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Well, here are these folks saying, hey, we're on your side, Nehemiah. We're all in this together. Come on down. Just come on down. But that proverb alone tells us not to look at the outward appearances, but to discern rightly. Judge rightly. It's okay to be patient in these times where you're unsure. I mean, the question should be asked, how do we develop? If we're lacking in discernment, it's quite easy. Spend time with God. Open his word. Begin to see the real thing, and you'll, you'll understand the counterfeit right away. It is the bank teller illustration. Let's hold real money so when fake money comes, we know it quite quickly. Right, grow in your walk with the Lord. Grow in your spiritual maturity. Move from the milk of God's word to the meat. Yes, right? And in moments where you're unsure, pray. What should we do here? 
See, without discernment, we can, uh, we can allow the enemy to, to say a lot of things that just simply are true, and we, we, we accept it as such. We accept it as true. We might accept somebody just simply, uh, hey, they, their, their belief looks like real genuine faith, when in reality, we see their lives, and it's, it's not matching up. We might be thinking the Lord is saying, no, now is the time to go, or maybe we're thinking it's later, or vice versa. We can make a long list. When we walk with the Lord, we begin to see things as they truly are. And Nehemiah is using just this wonderful discernment. He's waiting. He's walking with the Lord. He's not going to be distracted from the work. He he realizes what's most important here. He has a a priority list. The the work must be done. And I think there's a powerful lesson for us at church. If the enemy can divert you from the Lord's service, he has won. You're giving more attention to what the enemy says than what the Lord says. Notice the persistence of the enemy. He marks it for us four times they came and said, come on, come on. Then we see in the passage a little bit later is the fifth time, a new tactic. And he says, I'm doing a great work. Now this goes without saying we must be doing a great work if this is going to be our answer. Responding to the snares, I've got a calling on my life. I'm a Christian. I'm a missionary. And it might be to the sphere of influence of where you live, right? To your family, coworkers, whatever it might be. You have a job. You have a life. You have a cross to bear. And you have a testimony to share. And you see in Nehemiah, his persistent discernment gives him focus. As he is persistent on what God has done, it becomes more clear to him. It's as if this moment begins to answer everything else that follows. And so we must be those who realize there might be a a hundred good things to you to do with your time, but those things are not good if they're keeping you from doing what the Lord has called you to do. The discernment gives us focus. And so here's the, the, the divergence, right? He wants, he wants to get Nehemiah to compromise. He wants to get him to stop working. And if a believer, right, if Nehemiah is to compromise, what is that of the testimony? What's left? What are the people who are looking to him as their governor, as their wonderful example, as the man who said, I fear the Lord, the man who walks with God? What do they begin to think of him? And then what do they begin to think of who he represents? It's vitally important for us. Compromised, right? Discredited, dishonored. What does the enemy want to do? Is it really a conversation? It reminds me of that, that joke of the hunter who's going out to hunt the bear, and, and he has his sights on the bear, and the bear stops and says, hey, let's negotiate here. Let's think about this. So the, 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 the hunter says, well, all right, let's, let's have a conversation. And so uh, the bear asks him, what do you want out of this? And he says, well, I'd like a bear coat. That's my goal here. Well, the bear says, well, I have something. I'd like to, to have a full stomach. The next picture, the bear's walking by himself, right? Both got what they wanted. <laughs> Compromise, negotiation, right? This is where it leads. So we have to be wise. The snares of the evil one come to us and very much different. You may not receive letters or some messenger coming. Definitely you're hearing it through social media. Compromise, compromise, compromise. How close, how close can you live your life to that edge? How close can you get there without going over? Nehemiah is not having that. He's not going to compromise. You see the answer. You know, as we look through these testimonies, we'll see at the end, we'll see not only how Nehemiah becomes this Christ figure for us, We see Jesus doing the same thing, same responses, enemies, same tactics, a message for us. So we see, right, there's going to be temptations to divert you. Why are you here, right? Why are you on this planet? So he has focused discernment, right? He knows. The next one is simply this, verses 5 through 9. 
uh, right, defamation. They're right? going to slander you. How does he respond? He speaks truth. He comes, right? This is the fifth time he says in verse 9, uh, with an open letter in his hand. Listen to what they're saying about him. Look, what, hey, it's reported to the nations. And Geshmu says that you and the Jews are planning to rebel. Therefore, you are rebuilding the wall. This is why you're doing it. Now we've figured it out. You are to be their king, according to these reports. You have also appointed prophets to proclaim in Jerusalem concerning you, a king is in Judah. And that's, this is, they're playing hardball here. This is like Dateline stuff, right? Like, whoa. And they tell them, and now it will be reported to the king according to these reports. All right, we're going to go tell the king of Persia what this is all about. He's going to come and wipe you out, Nehemiah. Now they say, come, let us reason together. Now let me ask you, if you said no, and then they come back with all this slandering, are you enticed at all to go, okay, you got me in this time? Uh, you, now that you've slandered me and lied about me, okay, now we'll meet. I know you're on the up and up. Is that right? We know. Enemy changes the tactic, right? If you stand for Christ, people will slander you comes, right? Just comes with the territory. But look at this. They're telling him, like, hey, hey, Nehemiah, everyone knows. We know. Everyone knows. You don't know, but we all know. That's step one of this, this slander. It's very vague, right? Everyone is talking about it. Uh, you may not know this, but we do. Uh, we all know. It's like saying everyone in Merced and Atwater and Winton, so you don't know this, but we're all have gotten together and we've been talking about it. A number of people have been saying. Well, who? Right? Uh, one is a number, also zero. Those are also numbers. The accusation is false. If a thousand people of a nation said this is, uh, well, they're all saying the same thing, doesn't it make it true. I mean, the, the Jews are replanting. You're, you're, you're planning to rebel. You're going to proclaim yourself king. I would imagine this moment when, when Nehemiah heard this, I bet he turned red. I bet he was outraged with this. He worked hard. What have we learned so far? He, is, he has lived his life back from the very beginning, right, to take this on, to bring all the, all the resources, to do everything he's gone through, that God alone, his holiness would be intact. It would be all about the work of God. It would not be about him. He's gone through great sacrifice. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, does the enemy care your sacrifice? Does he care your integrity? Does he care how much you've put in? Does he care your devotion to God? No, he wants to wreck it. I think that we need to understand that the enemy knows your hot buttons. Oh, this will get him. This will get her. Let's, let's get those accusations going. And then they respond after all of this. Now let's reason together. But he's not going to respond. I mean, he's not going to respond in the way they want. He says such things as you're saying have not been done, but... You are inventing them of your own mind. Let's call it what it is. Okay? Your father is the father of lies. You also are liars. You've invented it of your own mind. And we need to notice here that he does not go into some type of debate. He doesn't go into let's sit down and reason even though I'm on the wall and your messenger's down here. He doesn't do that. It's something we have to realize, just as we might be more concerned about what all the people, all y'all might be thinking about us, our enemy could care less what people think about them. They know who they are. They don't care about your facts or your explanation or your evidence. They don't care about these things. They want you to give in to their demands. They don't care if the world knows they are a liar. The, the means, right, justify the ends or vice versa. The ends justify the means. But ne Nehemiah sees what, this, what is this about. He wants to discourage you. I mean, how many of us would say they're all talking about it? Well, man, I can't do that if they're all talking about it. 
Uh, who am I to continue this work if they're all saying those things? We see another tactic, right? It is fear. For all of them were trying to frighten us. I think the enemy loves that one a lot. If he can get us afraid. We see Nehemiah's discernment again, right? He's responding, right? And I'm going to speak truth to this. That's not reality. That's not what it is. Uh, because of the fear of God, because this is his behavior, what does he speak to? This is not who God has called me to be. These are not reality. I'm going to speak truth to this. He, he realized the enemy cannot make him afraid. Fear is something he himself must choose. And he is choosing not to be uh, afraid of this. I think we have to come to this, this moment of realization that in our own lives, we're going to have people say things about us. You're going to be slandered. Uh, be encouraged if they're saying, right, things that you're standing for Jesus. That person's a Christ follower. I think that's a moment of like, yes, right, that's who I am. If you're going to talk about me, talk about what I stand for. Uh, isn't this Nehemiah? He's standing, this is his conviction. But do you realize this is a big problem for us? 2,000 years ago, the Stoic philosopher, Marcus Aurelius, observed this. We all love ourselves more than other people. That's a, that's a no-brainer there. But care more about their opinion than our own. Even Stoic philosophers are acknowledged. It doesn't matter whether it comes from friends, strangers, or enemies. Even though we love ourselves more and we struggle with that pride, we're going to be more concerned with what people we don't care as much for think about us. Man, the enemy knows that. How many of us will even work and labor hard to change our minds to even go that direction? What is the answer? Truth. That's not reality. That's not who I am. Uh, we might say, yeah, I was once that, but by the blood of Christ, just like Paul can say to the Corinthians, such were some of you. All of us can say at one point, yeah, you're right back then, but today I am cleansed by the blood of Christ. Nehemiah ends this, right, this phrase with prayer. He walks with God. Is the enemy going to slander you? Yeah. He's going to create fear. He's going to discourage you. Yes. It's going to get you to question your salvation. Did Jesus really save me? Well, you better believe it. He'll keep you there because you become inactive. I can't tell others about Jesus. I myself, I'm not even sure I'm saved. How many Christians live there? Brother, sister, if you're there, stop living there. Come to Calvary. Make your salvation sure. Repent, believe on the Lord. This leads to the last one, right? This didn't work. This tactic didn't work. So what does he do? Religious deception, absolutely. Let's come and let's conjure up some new stuff here. Let's get some new guys going in the scene. Let's bring a, a prophet for hire. Well, that's outstanding, isn't it? We just hire these guys. Let us meet together. Now notice where they say this. Let's meet together in the house of God within the temple. As he respond, what does what does Nehemiah respond? Man, he knows. He walks with the real deal. He walks with God. He has godly obedience as his response. And they tell him, right? Let's 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 come to the house of God. There's safety there within the temple. Look, they're coming to kill you. They're gonna come at night, but we can be safe here. That sounds pretty good. His response should give us some insight. What does he say? In verses of verse 11. But I said, should a man like me flee? And could one such as I go into the temple to save his life? Well, there's some biblical knowledge there. I am not allowed to go to a place that only prophets can go. I will not go in. So we see this, right? Here it is. I don't know if Nehemiah has ever come to this moment in his life where you can rent a prophet. I don't know if that's brand new. I don't know if he's going like, well, I guess we can just rent these guys now. I don't know. You know, they didn't go through the proper procedure. That he would have a rent a prophet, right? Shemaiah said to be a prophet. He is not a prophet. 
He offers Nehemiah, come, right? Hey, they're going to kill you. Oh my goodness, they're going to kill me. Are you serious? They just slandered me, right? But this is the end goal anyway. They're going to come and kill you. And it sounds reasonable, doesn't it? Uh, let's come to the, to the house of God within the temple. I mean, that sounds biblical. Psalm 61, 4, let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge in the shelter of your wings. You can almost go like Nehemiah, man, if there's anything left. I mean, this is it. We can meet in safety here. But he has better discernment. See, our discernment must take into account the whole counsel of God. All of what God's word says. Again, he says they're creating fear in us. His response, should a man like me flee? I will not go in. It's the only priests were allowed in the temple. That's their tactic. Let's use some religious language. Let's get you to compromise. Nehemiah knows, 2 Chronicles 26, when King Uzziah, who was not a priest, went into the temple and God instantly struck him with leprosy. And this is why religious deceptions must be met with godly obedience. So Maya knows, right? He's got the religious talk. He's got the, the religious lingo. He sounds right. But Nehemiah is not listening to the lingo or the sounding. He's listening to what he is actually saying. <clears throat> Just so you know that this is, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, there's a book coming out in July written by Megan Beshan, who Dr. John MacArthur has said is probably one of the greatest reads. He's already read the book. Uh, for evangelicalism in the last few years, the book is titled Shepherds for Sale. And in the book, she has done her investigating. I've read some of her articles. She does a wonderful job. But in this book, she's investigated the infiltration of secular foundations and think tanks, deliberately targeting Christian media, universities, megachurches, nonprofits, and entire denominations, high-profile pastors, and influencers. Why? 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 Because she has learned that they are secretly sowing seeds of discord, much like the Soviets once did. She has found out that there are progressive power brokers in America who want to transform the American church. The book's coming out in July. You can pre-order it on Amazon. But just like Nehemiah's day, you can rent a prophet. Do you realize we live in a day where you can rent a pastor? It used to mean something, that title. It still does. It's just today we, we have lowered the bar. We allow anyone into the pulpit who sounds right. They've got the right words. They, they've got the right lingo. They've got the right look. Again, whatever that is. But we'll set under them and we'll say they have the right words and they sound right. But we're not listening to what they're saying. In the documentary, Enemies Against the Church, there were some in this church in Florida who were convinced their pastor teaches biblical truth. They took excerpts of his sermons and they showed him and he was actually espousing Marxism and they were floored. In the context of Sunday morning, we sat there, we sing the songs, he's always good, he's always good, and they're not listening. What is he actually saying? Nehemiah's comfort is his obedience to God, his loyalty to God, the fear of God. It marks who he is. And in these moments, even though the words sound right, his obedience wins the day. So we must be obedient. We must give ourselves to the study of God's word. We must be saturated in it. I mean, God has revealed there are false prophets. Nehemiah, he's a prophet for hire. And we look at this, and we see this pattern of our enemy, right? There's pretended friendships just come down off the wall, and uh, they want to divert him. He sees it for what it is. There's defamation of character. They're going to slander him. He responds with the right answer. Then we see this false religion idea, come to the temple. He's going to have none of it. He sees it for what it is. He's listening to what's being said. 
It's as if we should come to church on Sundays with our eyes closed. It's the contrast between, it was a Nixon and Kennedy. We like Kennedy, he looked better. Nixon had a better understanding and grip of the times. If you listen to it, Nixon won the debate. If you watched it, Kennedy won the debate. Look at the parallel. Do you see how the enemy is persistent? He does the same thing. Nehemiah, come down. Come down to us. Jesus, hey, why don't you, if you are the son of God, come down. Come off that cross, show us. Jesus was doing a great work. It's not going to be stopped. It grows. They slander Nehemiah. He doesn't defend himself. He spoke truth. He spoke truth. He trusted God. Jesus slandered. He doesn't debate his critics. He speaks truth. He trusted his Father in heaven. False prophet is offered to Nehemiah. Here's an easy way out. The way of fear and disobedience. Nehemiah will have none of it. Jesus was also offered away from the cross. Just bow down and worship me, Satan said, and all the kingdoms will be yours. Jesus would have none of it. Same tactics. We see in this lesson that we, right, this morning, we are not to act cowardly nor disobedient. We are not to drive our lives as close to the world as we can. We are to be those who have our lives rooted in the fear of God. It grows our confidence and our trust. If I was to ask you, what do you know of a cowardly person? You would say things, they avoid difficulties, they fail to complete tasks, they have weak in character, and you would add many more things to that list. But if I was to ask you this question, what would you think of a believer who's professed in Christ Jesus as redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, who acts Cowardly, what would you think of that person? Well, we would say something like their testimony would be damaged, that they would dishonor the name of the Lord. You might even go to the point of saying, I think they're acting hypocritical. But do you not realize this morning, church, this is what Nehemiah is showing us. If we profess Christ and the importance of living righteously, yet accept wicked behavior in our lives, and we don't speak for righteousness or don't stand for righteousness, we are in fact acting cowardly. We would come down off of that wall. What a challenge to us. We don't want to flee the opportunities to bear a strong testimony of our God. He so loved me. He sent his Savior to redeem me. I want to bear a strong testimony to his commandments. On his day, I assemble, and my worship is weak and broken, but my God is great and mighty. I want to live a righteous life because he is worth living for. And our testimony is truly discredited when we drive our life as close to the world. How can I, can I get close to the world? not knowing the snares of the enemy. Brothers and sisters, I'll tell you, the snares, just as they were for Nehemiah, as they were for our Lord, they are in front of you today. He would like to divert you. There's always something better to do to come to church. There's always something better to do than stand for truth. I mean, the list could go on. The enemy today will slander you. Respond with truth. That's not who you are in Christ Jesus. That might be who I once was. That's not who I am today. He'll definitely use deception. Maybe come packaged in the right Christian words and and lingo. Listen to what they're saying. Have godly obedience to to the real God. Apply biblical wisdom to all his tactics. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you again as we've opened your word and just confronted with a wonderful, powerful illustration of Nehemiah to our own lives. And it's in this passage, Lord, it's not just that he's the leader. We, we see that for what it is, but it's his conviction. 
his obedience to you, it shines. And just as the first response was the right response, and we see the enemy changing its tactics, it's still the same answer. It's the right answer. I will not stop the work in which you've called me. Father, I thank you for this truth. I pray that the enemy would not take it from us. Let us meditate on this, our own walk with you, our lives. Lord, it's, it's, it's meant to challenge us in areas where maybe we are uh, quicker to compromise than we should be. Lord, let us not be those. But let these truths bring about, Lord, right conviction, not, not legalism. Lord, we want to follow you because you first loved us. That's why we love you. We want to be those who, like the disciples, rejoice when we suffer for your name. We look forward to grabbing that cross because we understand what Calvary means. We get to live for you. We get to follow you. And one day, Lord, there will, there will come a moment where we get to embrace you. But until that time, Lord, let us be those who are focused in our devotion. Bless us by your spirit. Give us discernment to see the snares for what they are. Let our lives be saturated in biblical truth, that we would speak truth. The enemy is going to lie about us. He's going to bring up things in our past. Let us realize those are dealt with in Christ Jesus, especially if we've repented. And for religious deceptions, Lord, continue. Draw us close that we would not be those, Lord, who, who drive our lives close to the edge. Stay far from those things because we see, we see them for what they are. Lead us that way. Lord, I pray that every soul here today would be encouraged and edified, strengthened and challenged. Lord, let us live for you as we enter this Passion Week. Ready us, Lord, for next Sunday, as always, to come. Uh, let this be a week of worship and praise that when we come on Sunday, we would just be overflowing worship and praise you. Lord, we thank you. We love you. We pray all this in just the, the powerful name, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.